Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Friday, September 10th, 2021, and today we're going to be talking about the 2021 United States elections and how the Republican Party likely won't see any major victories or moral victories across our elections map for this year. Now, the reason why this is so important is because in 2017, many elections actually occurred and many special elections that narrowed up in a fashion that showed that the Democratic Party would make major advancements in the 2018 midterm elections. Doing a bit of a flashback, four years ago, we actually saw Number one, the main and most important thing that happened in 2017 for the Democrats was that they flipped the state of Alabama from red to blue on the Senate level. The state of Alabama, which gave Donald Trump a 28-point margin of victory over Hillary Clinton, that the Democratic Party was able to end up winning in that Senate race, ultimately bringing the Senate majority down to 40, uh, 51 for the GOP. Now, looking at 2017, it wasn't just the Senate elections. There were two governor elections, Virginia and New Jersey, and New Jersey which actually was a flip. Chris Christie held this seat and Phil Murphy went on to defeat his lieutenant governor, Chris Christie's lieutenant governor, uh, defeated her by around 15 points. So looking at New Jersey, it was a flip from red to blue and the Democrats absolutely obliterated the GOP when it came down to this race. Moving over to the state of Virginia, in this gubernatorial election, Ralph Northam defeated Ed Gillespie by a margin of nine percentage points. And the reason why that is so important is because the polling data only predicted a Northam victory of 3.3%. In addition, that victory was not expected to be as large as it was here, and the Republicans actually ended up being in a position where they started out on election night in 2017 with a supermajority in the House of Delegates being reduced down to a one-seat lead by the end of the evening. So you saw in Virginia that there were monumental gains for the Democratic Party. They flipped the state of New Jersey. They flipped the Alabama Senate special election in December. And in addition, they had moral victories. Now, what is a moral victory? Essentially, this is when you don't exactly win a race, but you bring it down to a narrowed up margin where you see tremendous increases in support, which indicate in the future that you will be end up, you will end up winning in some of these areas or doing very well in specifically House elections in the upcoming midterm years. You can see here that, for instance, the first one that occurred was in the 34th district. Now, the first one that occurred, sorry, one of the ones that occurred, it was in the 34th district. Now, this was actually held uh, a race between two Democrats, so it wasn't really any type of competitive race. There was no real reason to focus on that race. In Georgia's 6th district, Tom Price won in 2016 by 30 points against his Democratic opponent. Karen Handel defeated John Ossoff by around five points in 2017. A tremendous increase in John Ossoff, if you recognize the name, yes, it is the same John Ossoff, went on to become a senator, and the 6th District flipped in 2018 and stayed that way in 2020. In Kansas's 4th District, Republican Mike Pompeo, ring a bell, he looks like he might be running for president in 2024. It says here that Mike Pompeo held this seat, and that was won by Ron Estes, but he defeated uh, James Thompson in this race, and it was a race that was actually very, very competitive. You see, the 4th District, if we want to jump over really briefly, uh, you can see just how Republican it was in the past. In 2016, the Republican won in this race by a very large margin, defeated the Democrat here by over 30 points. So Mike Pompeo had an exceptional margin, but in 2017, Ron Estes only defeated his opponent by 6.2%. That moves us over to Montana where Democrats were able to get within uh, around five points of this race. In South Carolina's 5th District, they got within four points. In Utah's 3rd District, it narrowed up from where it was in 2016. So all around, what do we notice here? That the Senate flipped uh, in, in terms of that individual seat. Democrats were able to flip a governorship and were able to hold on to a governorship by a very solid amount. And all of these House seats, every single one, swung tremendously towards the left. For 2021, the Republicans are in that position where they were thinking at one point in time that they could have done this. They could have seen and replicated what the Democrats did in 2017, except on their end. And for a brief period of time, they were right. It started out strong when you took a look at the uh, Louisiana uh, races here when Republican turnout seemed to be higher than it was for the Democrats. When uh, in New Mexico's first district, there was the possibility that Democrats would be lower in terms of turnout that ended up not being true. And the Democrats ended up doing very well in that first district. In the sixth district, this was a district where Democrats were not able to find a nominee ending up in the top two. So it wasn't really contested by Democrats. But instead, they did display their support by actually going against the Republican Susan Rice, uh, sorry, Susan Wright, 
who was uh, endorsed by President Trump. Democrats, in a sense, turned out for Jake Elzey and wanted him to become the nominee instead of a Trump-endorsed Republican. So looking at the House of Representatives here, you have four races and practically none of them, besides the initial Texas sixth race that locked out the Democrats, which really wasn't a major indicator of anything. All around, either Donald Trump ended up uh, on the bottom, or for the rest of these, it was just a standard type of race and the margins really didn't shift much. And then we can also take a look at the upcoming governor elections. Now, this is where the Republican Party really could have shined. And I'll explain to you what I mean. Looking at our governor map right now, typically speaking, you never sort of think about California as a competitive state. California as a state that is at all within that realm of possibility of going to the GOP. But in 2021, this year, it actually nearly did. For a brief period of time, yes, remove. And the reason why this is up, it's a recall election. It's a whole process. They decided that they do not, not want Gavin Newsom in office, a small select group of people. Now it's a ballot initiative. Now people will vote on whether or not Gavin Newsom should remain in the governor's office. But you see here that the yes remove was an 11 point yes remove. This was ahead Survey USA, which actually skewed the average. It started out strong, double digits for Gavin Newsom remaining in office, and then it moved down to single digits. Then it moved down against him. Then it went up to single digits, remained in single digits, and now it's plus 16. But this race for a brief period of time had the yes remove above the no do not remove. California, for a very brief period of time, was actually in a position where it seemed that there was a very, very high possibility that Gavin Newsom was going to be recalled. In that instance, the state of California nearly went red. And then you take a look at the, Cal the Virginia election in 2021. Terry McAuliffe and Glenn Youngkin, this is a repeat race of 2013. Now, Glenn Youngkin wasn't the nominee in 2013, but Terry McAuliffe was the Democratic nominee, and it actually was a very close race. It was decided by less than three points, but it was still a race that actually defied expectations because normally speaking in Virginia, the opposition party typically wins compared to the party in the White House when it comes down to this race, which is what happened in 2017, happened in 2009, happened in 2005, happened in 2001. The only person to break this streak in the 21st century was Terry McAuliffe in 2013. And now he might have to break it again. And it isn't a streak if he broke it once, but it is sort of that understanding that typically speaking, the opposition party wins. But for Glenn Youngkin, he actually started out in this race with uh, not leading. He never led in a single poll here. Actually, oh, I'm wrong here. Glenn Youngkin takes the lead in most recent WPA intelligence poll. Again, another Republican internal. Previously speaking, they said that uh, Terry McAuliffe was ahead by two points. So we will get into this. Actually, this will be another video. I had no idea that this poll was released. But looking at the numbers early on and throughout almost the entirety of it up to this most recent one, which is, again, a Republican internal, every single pollster practically has said at one point in time that Terry McAuliffe is going to win this race. And Terry McAuliffe never really had leads that were pushing Glenn Youngkin to a point where he couldn't even come back. The reason why Glenn Youngkin fumbled this race, and obviously it's still going on, but the reason why he is no longer in that position where it's a good 40 to 50% chance of victory, or even 20 to 30%, it's probably hovering around somewhere around 15%. But the point is that Glenn Youngkin ultimately messed up his campaign, contributed by largely in part by Donald Trump. Donald Trump endorsing him multiple times, saying Glenn Youngkin was going to make Virginia great again. Virginia rejected President Trump by 10.1% in the presidential election, largest margin of victory for a Democrat since 1944. So for Virginia voters to hear the rhetoric from President Trump that this candidate is going to make Virginia great again, they are going to turn out and vote in full force against whichever type of Republican is there being endorsed by President Trump and being labeled as the Virginia Donald Trump. And the next and final state that we can take a look at here that the Republican Party, at least in some point in time, might have considered to be competitive was the New Jersey governor's race. Now, the reason why I point this out is because in 2013, under President Obama's second term, it went to Chris Christie by 22 points. So looking at that race, Republicans actually have had a strong history in New Jersey. In fact, for a brief period of time, they were the favorites uh, when it came down to individual uh, races. When it also, you take a look at what happens in some of these more nationalized elections. When you take a look at the 2018 Senate race, Bob Menendez, by the regard of some political analysts, now not myself, I knew that race was going to be very solid for the Democratic Party, but for a brief period of time, some people genuinely thought that a Republican could defeat Bob Menendez in the state of New Jersey. 
Obviously, he didn't lose. But New Jersey, as a state that did vote to Joe Biden uh, by a safe blue margin, also needs to be recognized as a state that does have some type of strong history for the GOP. Now, Cetarelli here never really did well against, uh, uh, sorry, against Murphy here. When you're looking at the margin, it's always been plus 26, plus 15, plus 16, never lower than double digits. In 2017, that margin here for Phil Murphy was 13.3%. So it was actually a point lesser than what we saw, but now the numbers are indicating that the margin of victory is going to be higher. And I think that looking at what is happening here in 2021, what is happening when it comes down to this gubernatorial race is that Republicans, maybe for a brief period of time, thought they would have been able to make major inroads here. Because had they done that, or had they won Virginia or even California, and I know California seems to be the least likely, but to be quite honest with you, at a period of time was the most likely to go red in this uh, amongst the three. But just looking at what would have happened, he would have seen major precedent set, major types of energy waves on the Republican side if they were able to crack just one of these individual races. And the fact is, not only are they not getting these races, not only are they not getting New Jersey, Virginia, California, three states, New Jersey probably the one that was least likely to flip, but at least Virginia and California within single digits, within a percentage or two of going to the Republican Party both of them, within a percentage of two of going to the Republican Party in 2021, yet Republicans messed up on this case. Democrats simply just ran with their standard rundown, tying Republicans towards Donald Trump. And Donald Trump didn't really let up. He intentionally put himself in races, obviously not to lose them, because he knew that wouldn't be something that helps him, but he never wants to be left out of some type of process. Ed Gillespie left out President Trump in 2017 and was blown out of the water. Not because he left out President Trump, simply because he was still tied and closely associated with him. But now in 2021, number one, President Trump is already starting claims of election fraud. But Glenn Youngkin is also ignoring him, but still accepting the endorsement in a very heavily gracious manner on the national news media. So looking at what is happening here, Republicans thought at least at some point in time that they would be able to make major inroads in these three races, and they could have for a brief period of time. But now... They seem to be completely far away from going to the GOP. And in addition, like I said, it wasn't just these gubernatorial races. The Senate elections that already occurred were in Georgia. Now, I don't know if you remember, but that actually was this year. It feels like a very long year. In fact, 2022 is practically right around the corner. I hate to scare you like that, but it actually is. But when you're looking at these Senate elections and you see what happened in Georgia, straight away, you see what happened in the special election, you look at it and say, was this any type of increase for the GOP? Absolutely not. Had the margins been kept in place from 2020? Looking at the election night in Georgia in November, uh, David Perdue received 49.7% of the vote. John Ossoff received 47.9%. Why didn't he win? Because Georgia is weird. They have this runoff law where if you are less than 50%, you must continue on to a runoff election. Well, obviously, that didn't help David Perdue, because had David Perdue been in a state such as Maryland, my home state, and won 49.7% of the vote, he would have been a senator, would have been reelected, and Democrats would have never had a chance at controlling the United States Senate. In addition, the Senate special election, the combined Republican vote, was a point more than the combined Democratic vote. But instead of voters wanting a check and balance on President Biden, knowing that Biden was going to enter into the White House in January of 2021, knowing that Democrats were, were going to be resworn in as the majority in the House of Representatives. In addition to that, instead of turning on the party that was entering in with two chambers of Congress, one chamber of Congress and the White House, the voters in Georgia shifted towards the left. So they were initially, the Republican Party, when I say they, was initially hit down, beaten at these early runoff elections in Georgia. Then it went on to these House elections in which Democrats began to do better or were at least matching what they were in 2020. And then also now these Virginia, California, and potentially speaking, New Jersey governor elections, all of which at some point in time were thought about or heavily prioritized and considered and invested in by the Republican Party, more specifically Virginia and California. Not one instance can I point out that the GOP has made major inroads amongst any voting group in 2021. They faltered in Georgia, they faltered across the United States, and now these governor elections just simply aren't going their way. This is not a matter of partisan politics, but more so the fact that they aren't matching expectations for a traditional year leading up 
to our midterm election year in 2022. What's happening now across the nation is not an indicator that a red wave is coming in 2022, the way that 2017 was in very much an indicator that in 2018, it was going to be a blue wave. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2021 election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all later today.